Hi everyone, it's Chaplain April here and I am going to do a quick book haul. Uh, since I have about 30 minutes of spare time here, I'm going to get this um, put together. Uh, because uh, I have done a lot of rearranging in my bookshelves, um, my Bible and devotional bookcase, I have rearranged a bunch of stuff. I've taken a lot of stuff off of my shelves, some of the decor and my icons I've put in another spot. And so my top shelf over here on this bookcase is all books waiting for a book haul video. New books that I've gotten. Um, but I also have a lot of books that I've never shown in a book haul and it's kind of hard to keep track of what I have shown and what not so I'm kind of going off of memory. I know I've shown a few books a couple of times but I don't think anybody really cares too much. <laughs> but my mentor was saying, April, when are you going to get to some of the greats, some of the women of the church that are... Um, that are are you know classic that that have been there for a long periods of time that have written stuff so i'm going to do that today so these are books i already these two are books i've already owned and have read and studied it's been a while though so i am going to have to you know brush up on these if i do a review so saint Teresa of Teresa of avila um, we call her my mentor and i call her Santa Teresa. Um, she, a friend of mine is doing his, I don't know if he's getting his doctorate or another master's, but he's doing his thesis or doctoral thing on, on her. So when he finishes that, I really want to read that. So I love the saints. For some reason in Protestant churches, we shy away from the saints and we can't talk about them and da da da. But these are amazing um, uh, people of the faith that we need to honor and respect. A lot of them have miracles. Well, they don't they they don't become saints in the Catholic Church unless they go through this process and there's miracles and stuff in their lives. We really need to look at these people. So I don't know if I actually finished this book. This is not one of those quick reads. So I don't know when we can do a review on this. This is something that you're gonna sit down and read and it's gonna be a little tough. It's gonna be harder to, you know, you're gonna have to really um, take time when you read this. But she, let's read about her. St. Teresa of Avila, also called St. Teresa of Jesus, Santa Teresa de Jesus, Baptized as Teresa Sanchez de Cepeda y, Cepeda y Almada, was a prominent Spanish mystic, Roman Catholic saint, Carmelite nun, author, and theologian of contemplative life through mental prayer. And contemplative life was a theme with a lot of these early church women. Um, and you will see that if you start to read some of them. But I, oh my gosh, this is the type of thing that is my favorite thing to read. So, um, if you have never read anything from her, I mean, you're, you're, you're going to be blown away. It, it, it's like delving into the spiritual realm, delving into your spirit soul, uh, God, you know, learning about God and the essence of who he is. I mean, this is where it's at. I, I mean, you've got to read this. So, um, you know, it's translated from Spanish, I guess. And my husband just surprised me the other day saying that um, he has, has done research on these military hops because he's a military guy in the Air Force. And they do these hop flights to Europe all the time. Of course, we'd have to get to the East Coast first, but whatever. So he wants to go to Spain, and that is somewhere that I have always, always wanted to go because, you know, I grew up in Latin America and I speak Spanish, and um, Spain is like the mother ship, the mother country, you know? And I just am in love with the architecture and the, and the churches and all of that, all the religious um, history and stuff that is there. I don't care where in Spain we go. I will find a church. I will find somewhere to get inspired. 
Um, but he wants to take one of these military hops and I'm like, that's going to be an adventure. I have no idea what to think about that or what are we going to be like in the cargo thing of a plane? I don't know. So we'll see how that goes. So, all right, Santa Teresa. Okay. So the next one, this is another book I already owned, Hildegard of Bingen. And she is one of those early church women. Uh, also known as St. Hildegard and Sybil of the Rhine. She was a German Benedictine abbess, writer, composer, philosopher, Christian mystic, visionary, and polymath. That part, I don't know what that means. She's considered to be the founder of scientific natural history in Germany. So a lot of these people are mystics. A lot of saints are mystics, meaning they believe in the miraculous. They saw miracles in their life. They saw supernatural, extraordinary things happen in their lives. I am all about that. So I love reading about the saints. Um, I mean, I even went to visit a church in Costa Rica uh, that was the National Cathedral. Um, and there was, you know, there was a sighting there. That person was never made into a saint but anyway I just love all of that stuff so um, okay let's read what this says um, she lived in 1098 through 1179 and was one of the most remarkable women of the Middle Ages Sabina Flanagan who's the historian that wrote about her provides a comprehensive and engaging introduction to the life and works of the visionary, mystic, poet, musician, naturalist, healer, and theologian that was Hildegard of Bingen. So a lot of them are Christian mystics. I consider myself a Christian mystic also. They're visionaries, they're, you know, they, they healers, poets, and, you know, so in, I think, uh, I mean, we are lacking a lot of that in our spirituality these days. Everything is kind of like, uh, ho-hum and you know status quo and I'm just gonna go to church I don't expect anything to happen I don't believe in miracles I don't believe in speaking tongues and I just forget the spiritual no guys okay we cannot do that we are we are uh, robbing ourselves of some amazing amazing things we are denying the power thereof whatever that verse is we don't want to do that, okay? And um, this is why I like to study women of the church, women of the Bible, women of the faith, because women have been persecuted in ministry, especially since the dawn of time. So we're not supposed to speak out. We're not supposed to uh, preach or teach or do any of those things. And a lot of it is based on this First Timothy scripture. I'm about to get to that in a second. Um, and so... You know, we weren't supposed to write books. We weren't supposed to do this and that. And it's still that way, you guys. The reason, one of the reasons that I was ordained in the Pentecostal Holiness Church is because it is one of the um, most progressive uh, denominations. It was one of the first denominations that ordained women. And I fully believe that women can be ordained. I fully believe that God can call women to preach, teach, do whatever. I mean, it's God, and who who are you to tell a woman that God did not call her to something? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, I just completely disagree with that. So we have an example here. Okay, so Stephen Furtick, he is a very popular Bible, uh, well, he's a pastor, but he has a, a television vision, um, his Sunday morning sermons, I guess you could say are on television. I don't really ever watch him. I have a few times. He's not one of the guys that I watch in my lineup. But, I mean, I like him. He's just very radical, very out there, theatrical and all that. And, you know, it's not really my style, but um, I'm sure he's good. So, this is called Greater. It says, Dream Bigger, Start Smaller, and Ignite God's Vision for Your Life. He is very popular. He's an author and everything. Well, this lady that goes to his church, her name is Lisa Turkhurst. Okay, here's her book and then the devotional that goes with it. It's called Unglued. 
So she is like a breakout, what would you call it? A breakout um, star, I guess you could say maybe in the Christian world um, because it's very rare for someone that is unknown that doesn't have their own following to write books and become very popular. You know, you kind of have to be the pastor of the church and have your own following. That's kind of how books, how um, um, book companies want you to do it these days. It's just completely different than it used to be. They want you to do your own marketing and da da da. So I don't really know how Lisa became this big um, speaker and writer. And I and and I know that she goes to his church and maybe he helped her with the platform to get launched out but she has a ministry it's called proverbs 31 ministries and um she is the um leader of that ministry and she writes a lot of books this is one of her first books i still haven't read any of them but i know about lisa turkhurst i've seen her speaking i've seen her on different shows i've known about her books for a long time i just had never gotten one but she um People are saying, don't listen to Lisa Tur Turkhurst. Um, she shouldn't be teaching. She shouldn't be preaching. I'm, I'm reading a vlog right now where it says, um, <sighs> I hoped against hope that Lisa was a doctrinally sound teacher of God's word that I could re recommend to my friends and readers. In fact, I resisted vetting her for a while because I was afraid of being disappointed by another popular Christian women's author and teacher who seemed biblical on the surface but turned out not to be. Sadly, that is exactly what I found when I began to research Lisa Turkhurst at the request of several of my friends. It's my prayer that Lisa will repent of the areas in which she's acting against scripture, learn biblical hermeneutics so she can rightly handle God's word and have a tremendous doctrinally sound impact on the thousands of women who love her so much. I would love nothing more than to give her a virtual high five and highly recommend her to others if she would do so. Until such time, I regret that I must recommend that women not follow Lisa Turkhurst or Proverbs 31 Ministries uh, for the following reasons, blah, blah, blah. She unrepentantly preaches to and instructs men at church worship services. Um, which goes against, and she speaks at Catalyst and stuff, um, this Timothy 2, 12 through 14 scripture, which I'm about to read. <clears throat> Without exception, every female Bible teacher I know of who unrepentantly instructs men also teaches other doctrinal error. Okay, so let's read this scripture in question. <laughs> I mean, this really gets me riled up, okay, because when I started, when I became ordained and a chaplain, I was in my late 20s, and I looked like I was about 12, because <laughs> I've always kind of had a baby face, but just imagine, okay, here um, I was doing my internship at a hospital, rotating at three different hospitals. It was Presbyterian Children's and University Hospitals, and at times we would have to have um, the pager for all three hospitals on our 24 hour on call. Now they've completely revamped it. I think they only do 12 hour on calls and I don't know if you're on call for three hospitals or not, but I remember having deaths at two different ERs and having to run back and forth. Da, da, da. But at whatever hospital we were assigned to in our rotation, we would have a floor that we would have to um, visit all the patients on that floor in addition to these other things. And I remember I would walk into someone's room and tell and, and say, you know, did you request a chaplain? And um, I'm one of the chaplains and people would be like, you're kidding, right? You're the chaplain. Like they expected a middle age white male who was probably retired from his church. That's what the expectation was. So imagine how difficult it was for me in my 20s looking like I'm 12, okay, and being very um, soft-spoken and, you know, not wanting to, you know, ruffle anyone's feathers and things like that. So it was like sometimes people would think this is like a joke, you know. And then there were other people that loved it. They're like, oh, I think that's amazing. I think that's great. But 
there's this expectation that women, and this has always been in the church, that women should not do this type of thing. And women should not be up on stage. Women cannot be pastor. Women cannot, and it all stems from this one dang scripture. And it just gets me very upset. So, 1 Timothy 2, 12. But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. Uh, oh, wait. And the verse before, let a woman quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. Um, and this is, you know, we're, we're going to have to study this, but I'm sorry, but you can't take that one verse and, and, and make it seem like women cannot teach and preach. I, I just have, that clashes with my spirit because I know so many women that were called to that. And I'm not going to tell them they're wrong. I'm not going to tell them God did not call you. Who am I to tell them that? Who is any man to tell them that? It's just like the scriptures of, you know, women submit to your husbands. Men took that to mean we have to submit to all women, all men everywhere. No. It's one man. It's our husband. I don't have to submit to you and you and you and all these men. <laughs> I'm not married to them. So, no. Um... And I feel like that's how this this scripture has been taken. It's a cultural thing. It's the way churches were back when, da, 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 da. But women have been put down and not allowed. And we have missed out on so much because of this type of thinking. To me, that's a pharisaical way of thinking. And I'm going to have to save the rest of my comments before I get into a huge discussion here. But, you know, I know like the Catholic Church does not ordain women. That's a whole whatever. You know, I'm not, I'm not Catholic. I, I disagree with that completely. Um, so, but one of my best friends is a Catholic chaplain. And she was not allowed, she, she had this, this amazing job opportunity that she could not take because she was not ordained. And because she could not get her ecclesiastical endorsement, which she should have been able to get. I don't, I don't know. But now she's taken a whole different route through a Catholic. She's gotten a certain degree and everything. I don't want to have to do all of that. And I am ordained. But it's just been so difficult for women in ministry. So imagine for poor Hildegard of Bingen and poor St. Teresa of Avila. You know, it, 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 it's unreal. It's unreal the persecution that women have had from the dawn of time and especially in ministry. Okay, I have to get off of my soapbox. But men, just because a woman is teaching, that does not mean that she is having authority over you. <laughs> I mean, I, okay, I, I just, Lord, please help me. I don't understand. So, you know, Lisa, and the other thing about Lisa Turkhurst is that she is going through a divorce. So that's another thing. You know, sadly, um, we have been taught for years and years that if a person is divorced, that they should not be in ministry and et cetera, et cetera. God hates divorce. Da, da, da. Well, um, you know, I'm here to tell you I'm a divorced person. I did not want the divorce I wanted I did everything in my power to keep my marriage together etc so there is an innocent person a lot of times in these divorces and um, so that person should be persecuted for the rest of their life and not allowed to move on and not allowed to ever minister so the fact that she's going through this divorce has put this huge shadow over her and her ministry I pray for her because we don't know the details of her divorce. We don't know. Is there abuse involved? Is there, you know, there there, there could be, um, who knows what involved. And it's kind of like there there's this view that women should just endure everything and take anything just to become, just to remain married, just so you can say that you are married, whether it's a real marriage or a sham of a marriage or not. Uh, and that is totally wrong, you guys. It is so wrong. We are doing an injustice to women everywhere by telling them that. And so, I mean, I even hesitated in doing um, 
these videos and doing anything in ministry because of after I was divorced but you know uh, the Holy Spirit rose up in me and was like no April no you know that's that's an old way of thinking we're not gonna go there I if I want to use you I'm going to use you it's as simple as that okay moving on to every woman's desire um, Stephen Arterburn he actually started women of faith and that whole thing went on for 20 years. And they had so many thousands of women that went through there. And so we had these women ministering to women, okay? And it was a phenomenon. It was amazing. But there, there's this um, book, uh, there's Every Man's Desire and I think other books. Um, so, oh, best-selling authors of Every Man's Battle. Every Man's Battle. So, Every Woman's Desire. Let's see. Uh, they believe that every man can meet the secret desire of his wife. The problem is most of us aren't exactly sure what that desire is and how we can go about fulfilling it faithfully. In Every Woman's Desire, you can discover the common misconceptions about what it means to exercise biblical authority and understand the role of submission in the marriage relationship. The groundbreaking book can help men grasp and apply essential but often overlooked principles for marital leadership. So men are supposed to read this book for their wives and then women are supposed to read Every Man's Battle to understand the battle that all men go through because there are these general themes that go through everyone's life um, based on gender so you know it's not exact but there are these general things that we need to know okay uh, we have nurture by Lisa Bevere and I've talked about Lisa Bevere several times I saw her speak at women of faith she and her husband have been on all the programs that I watch, and she is dynamic if you get to hear her speak in person. I think she's she's spoken at so many conferences. I mean, you can look it up, just pretty much everything. Um, and she and her husband have been writing Christian books, and they've been doing all of this for forever, 20, 30 years or more. So she has all these people that endorse her because, of course, she knows everyone in the Christian arena. You know, Darlene Jack, Joyce Meyer, Holly Wagner, um, Bobby Houston, these are Hillsong people, Christine Kane. So, um, Lisa Bevere, she's amazing. This book is Give and Get What You Need to Flourish. So, I guess nurture yourself. And that is a, one thing that women and wives and mothers need to do. Um, we don't get nurtured. We're supposed to nurture and we nurture everyone around us, but we don't get nurtured. So I'm assuming that's what that's about. Take care of yourself or you will not be able to take care of anyone else. You won't have anything left. <laughs> so, okay. Who was the man? What was the message? The stranger on the road to Emmaus. And I love the road to Emmaus. And the Methodist um, tradition, they have a retreat that you can go to called the road to Emmaus where you have this... Um, whole thing uh, you can't just go to it you have to be invited by um, someone in the Methodist Church you can't just go to the retreat um, but it's in Luke 24 32 it states that the two disciples hearts were burning during their conversation with Jesus along the way to Emmaus especially when he explained the scriptures okay so these they were walking towards Emmaus and they didn't realize that the man they were walking with was Jesus. And so you go on this um, spiritual journey called the road to Emmaus and it's really cool. So that's what this book is about. Um, here is a book that explains the greatest of Bible themes clearly and logically rather than focusing on one part. The author chronologically binds together the entire text into one great universal drama, looking at events from the perspective of those who experienced history in the making. The results are sometimes comical, sometimes frightening, but always true to the intent of the text. Um, let me see if I can... Oh, 
gosh, no, I don't want to go there. Anyway, you can read about it in Luke 24, 13 through 35. Um, and they ask Jesus these questions and, and everything. And so it's really cool. It's a really famous thing, The Road to Emmaus. So I'm anxious to read that book because it'll be really good, really insightful about that. Um, so at the end of, like in verse 30, they finally recognize that it's Jesus that they're talking to. So this is a really cool, really powerful thing that happens there. All right. Gloria Copeland. Okay, I know you guys. I'm a charismatic. Um, I'm not like a fanatical, whatever, charismatic, um, but, you know, these are, I, I, I like the Copelands. I, I don't read a whole lot of their stuff, but, you know, I like it that she's on television and she has her own Bible, um, you know, show and, and everything. I don't think I have ever read any of her books unless, um, my dad's library a long time ago. I probably did read something. I don't even remember what but he had books of her husband's and stuff um, This is live long and finish strong the divine secret to living healthy happy and healed One of the things that I love that I've always heard about the Copelands is that they would declare on a daily basis that they were that their youth was renewing uh, as the eagles or something like that. So they've always stayed very youthful and look very youthful. So that's an example of declaring things out, of speaking things out. And as I said before, our words are very powerful. Um, if you'll notice throughout the Bible um, where Jesus speaks things, God speaks things out and they accomplish something. Words, um, you know, in the spirit realm are alive and they do go out and accomplish something, uh, whatever God is wanting it to accomplish. So anything that you speak over yourself, it's good to um, it's good to write down and have these declarations that you speak out every day. And they can pertain to anything in your life. They can be about health, wellness, your finances, you know, anything. And um, God will honor it. And uh, and it's speaking good things out into the spirit realm about you and your family. So we will study that even more later on. Um, but uh, anyway, I hope some of these books will inspire you to delve into Christianity more. There is so much more that we are missing. There is so much more about the spiritual realm, spirit realm and the spirit world and that God wants to show us and that God um, wants us to partake in and to have in our own lives. Let's not miss out on all of these powerful things that are happening, you guys. These things happen, healings happen, and um, all of these things are part of what God wants for us. Someone is banging on the door, <laughs> I'm gonna have to go. So anyway, check out these books and I will see you in a couple of days. Talk to you later.